everyone, Dr. David Perlmutter here. You know, there's certainly uh, unlikely more uh, uh, discussion these days uh, than uh, this whole situation with respect to GMO. Is it good? Is it bad? Is it offering us uh, salvation in the form of uh, giving larger availability to food around the planet? Or is it threatening? Likely the answer is going to lie somewhere in the middle. I think it's valuable to look at both sides of the story. Uh, certainly, there has been raised some concern about the genetic modification of our food, not only directly how that might be threatening, but in terms of what that might pave the way for in terms of things like uh, herbicides and pesticides, etc. Well, taking one side of the argument is a, a good friend of mine, Jeffrey Smith. He's the founding executive director of the Institute for Responsible Technology and the leading consumer advocate promoting healthier non-GMO choices. Uh, he was featured in the uh, full-length documentary called Genetic Roulette, or rather, he actually uh, produced this, The Gamble of Our Lives, and that received various awards way back in 2012. Uh, he has been a driving force in raising awareness of the potential dangers of uh, this whole GMO I idea, really around the world. Uh, you may have seen him in the New York Times, Washington Post, Time Magazine, BBC, NPR, Fox News, Democracy Now!, The Doctors, and The doc, uh, Dr. Oz Show as well. Uh, joining me today, my co-host is Dr. Austin Perlmutter. Yes, the same last name, my son, Austin Perlmutter, MD. Uh, he's going to join us as we explore uh, Jeffrey Smith's views on GMO, so let's jump right into that. Well, Jeffrey Smith, it's really good to see you. Ah, oh, great to see you too, David. So uh, now working with Austin, and we want to know um, what's new in your world. I mean, I, I, in the introduction, talked about all the things that, you're, that you've been doing, that you've done, uh, movies, etc. So tell us what's new in the world of GMO, or may I say anti-GMO. That's true. Um, there's actually a lot going on. Uh, yesterday, the EPA said, Roundup is safe. <laughs> and the day before, Kellogg said, we're stopping the spraying of, of Roundup uh, on, uh, as a pre-harvest desiccant by 2025. So it tells you where, where, where the pressure points are, not on the, on the federal government, but on, on uh, <clears throat> local corpor on corporations and uh, the <clears throat> for-profits, not the public. All right, public. Jeffrey, let me ask you right off the bat, what do you mean when you say pre-harvest desiccant and the use All of right. Roundup? I mean, traditionally, we've thought about Roundup as a way of killing weeds. So tell us more about this pre-harvest desiccant part. All right, just before harvest, uh, three to five days before harvest, uh, some farmers can spray wheat, uh, barley, oats, lentils, mung beans, uh, a lot, basically the beans and the grains, uh, in order to dry it down. It forces rapid um, uh, maturation of the grains so that in case there's a short um, growing season, They'll spray it so that it'll cause ripening very quickly. For the farmers, it's, it also is called staging, meaning it kills all the weeds for the next year. And then because it's drier as it's dying, uh, there's less chance of mold. Uh, it's easier to, to harvest. And so it's a pretty big practice, David. And so, right, it used to be that I would say um, eat non-GMO and if you can't eat organic. But there's higher levels of glyphosate, the chief poison in Roundup, on oats, in hummus, which is not GMO, neither of them are GMO, uh, on mung beans, on lentils, than there is on Roundup Ready soybeans. Because in Roundup Ready soybeans, they don't spray just before harvest, but the other ones, it's just before harvest, it gets brought in there. And there is an outcry around the world because we know that even irrespective of what the EPA said, and we know why they said they're on, on lining up to support Monsanto. It's actually very dangerous, and we should never be eating anything with these level of Roundup residues on the foods. So, you know, just for our viewers, what you're saying is that these are crops that are not the typical genetically modified crops that we talk about these days, uh, and are things that would be marked possibly even non-GMO. Oh, yeah. And yet yet being, being sprayed with glyphosate. Uh, so 
<laughs> used to be a commercial on TV. What's a mother to do? <laughs> yes. And that was for total, uh, I, uh, total cereal. But anyway, yeah, ahead, yeah. Tell us. avoid total. Um, so, uh, so the non-GMO project, which is an excellent organization, third party verified, requires testing for GMO contamination. Uh, so the, the testing requirement is even higher than the organic requirement because organic does not require testing. I still say eat organic if you had a choice between organic and non-GMO project. Why? Because organic doesn't allow the spraying of Roundup and other toxic chemicals. Non-GMO project doesn't focus on chemicals. So you can have a non-GMO project verified bowl of oatmeal. Oatmeal has never been genetically engineered and commercialized, and it could be full of glyphosate, higher levels than you want to have. In fact, the Environmental Working Group tested over 20 children's cereals with oats in it, and there was glyphosate throughout because of the practice of spraying just before harvest. Uh, tell us why that's an issue. Uh, why should we care? Part. Okay, so I want to recommend that for your, for your fan club to watch you in the movie Secret Ingredients. Because, because that's, that's the poster I'm pointing to. <laughs> <laughs> Green screen behind you. Okay. We'll edit it in post. <laughs> All right. So Secret Ingredients describes the problems with GMOs and Roundup, and you do an excellent job talking about it as an antibiotic, the Roundup, and what it does to the gut bacteria. But it also shows that when people switch to organic food, they get better from a variety of conditions. There's two boys. In the, in the film that are, we're autistic, they're no longer on the spectrum. There's a chiropractic clinic where by the end of the film, 92 out of 92 couples who were infertile, some went to the fertility clinic without any success. They all have children, people who had cancer, people had skin conditions. And you wonder why is it that GMOs or Roundup or the combination or other things in organic could be contributing to so many different diseases? Well, in the film, we have uh, a, a representation of the more than 30 diseases that are rising in parallel with the increased use of Roundup sprayed on GMO soy and corn. Now, when you and I, I was giving a talk in Naples, and I had those 30 charts, and I said, David, can I invite you up on stage? I want to I want to give you a quiz. And I said, I'm going to describe a certain number of things that Roundup does to the body and then can you tell me if any of those things can contribute to the, any of these diseases? And there's about six types of cancers, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, autism, diabetes, uh, peritonitis, deaths from intestinal infection, I, uh, irritable bowel, um, anxiety, schizophrenia, overdose um, from, by, uh, suicide by overdose, schizophrenia, uh, all the uh, sleeplessness. And I described them and you described the mechanism by which Roundup could be leading or, or promoting that disease. And I'll go over those mechanisms in just a moment. Later, I talked to my friend, Kieran Krishnan, who's focused on the microbiome. He did a study just on the human microbiome and the impact of Roundup by doing a model. It's called the Scheim model. He did it in Belgium, and it's uh, state of the art. And he found the changes in the microbiome alone, the short chain fatty acids and a number of things and all that, could explain all those as well. So I'm going to describe to you the different pieces that the that Roundup or glyphosate, its chief poison, has been linked to. And you'll see, I think, that it's really the fundamental building blocks of health. In the film, you talk beautifully about the fact that Roundup or glyphosate is a patented antibiotic. And what's interesting is, I don't know of another antibiotic that acts like it in that it kills the beneficial bacteria, not the nasty stuff, the salmonella, the E. coli, the botulism. And it does it very effectively, killing the, the, the beneficials. Um, it also has been found, if you put it in a plate of human cells, you see the tight junctions, you put a little glyphosate, the tight junctions break apart. There's your leaky gut. It was originally patented as a chelator, a descaler, to use to clean boilers and pipes because it was a chelator, it grabbed out of the minerals, stripped the walls from inside the boilers and pipes. And what it does is it grabs onto minerals in the food supply and in our bodies, making them unavailable. And as you know, the minerals are cofactors in 
in biological pathways that without the mineral, all the workers are on strike. So there's a number of pathways that can be idle without the minerals. One of the pathways that it's known to block is called the shikimate pathway. And Monsanto got away for years saying that because the shikimate pathway is in plants and not in humans, there's no problem. But the shikimate pathway is used by our gut bacteria to produce the tyrosine and the L-tryptophan, which is necessary to produce the serotonin, melatonin, and dopamine. And recent research since the movie verified that it does block the shikimate pathway's ability to produce these in a rat model. So now we have the possibility of reduced neurotransmitters, which can have all sorts of effects. It also can affect aromatase, which determines the balance between estrogen and testosterone. It also can damage the structural integrity of cells and destroy the mitochondria. And you can see this in a microscope. And mitochondria you talked about in terms of brain health and energy, et cetera. We also just recently found out that the NRF2 ability for the detoxification of the cells, that's decreased by 30% in a test tube situation. And the gap junctions, which are different than the tight junctions, the gap junctions are what causes communication between the cells, that dropped by 50%, which is one of the mechanisms for cancer. Speaking of which, it also is genotoxic and causes oxidative stress, all of which can cause cancer. And it was determined by the World Health Organization's chief committee to be a probable human carcin carcinogen and definitely a carcinogen to animals. It also suppresses digestive enzymes and damages the walls of the, of the cells. Uh, 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 the otherwise, otherwise, it's pretty good stuff, right? Oh, yeah, I drink it. I have some right here. <laughs> um, you know, we're, we're, if you watch television, which we generally don't, but there seems to be, if you occasionally do, uh, either they're talking about mesothelioma or uh, looking for people with cancer that they feel may be caused by their um, exposure to glyphosate. How has that affected you in your day-to-day -day life and what in your mission? Well, the Roundup lawsuits have been spectacular. Um, a couple of years ago, um, there was a lawsuit, and Lee Johnson, who is a groundskeeper from right. Benicia uh, in, in the Bay Area, sued Monsanto. I attended part of the trial. Um, it was interesting that even before that, that, because of the trials, the law firms were able to obtain documents from Monsanto and make them public. They were made public, and I interviewed Brent Wisner on my responsibletechnology.org in like two hours of interviews. It's astounding. Monsanto made a simple mistake, and that allowed these millions of documents to be made public. They didn't respond within a 30-day period, and he was, okay, and he sent them all over and, and posted them. We realize now that all of the things that we have been talking about, their disinformation campaigns, their let, no, let nothing go campaign, they're attacking, they're hiring scientists secretly and pretending that they're not giving money, ghost writing for scientists, ghost writing for former um, FDA officials so that they can appear to be independent, getting their front groups going, um, attacking me, all of that, which we knew about, became clearly in black and white. We actually have the memos. In fact, in the third trial that we won, all three out of three, my name is mentioned in one of the documents under the title Whack-A-Mole. Because they, they go after me and they call it whack-a-mole because every time I come up with something, they sick one of their pseudoscientists on me to try and do damage control. So that was great. Also, I had, um, I had debated Donna Farmer, their toxicologist, on the doctor's TV show just after the International Agency for Research on Cancer determined that glyphosate was a class 2A carcinogen. And she was lying. And she said she's confident in it, and it was, it was healthy, and as a mother and as a scientist, how do we know she was lying? Well, I knew the details, and I was giving what, as best I can, as fast as I can. But when the documents came out, I, ran, I, I did a search for her name, and there it was in black and white, telling someone else in Monsanto, we can't say that the full formulation doesn't cause cancer. There we have her ghostwriting an article, removing the association with between Roundup mm. and miscarriages, eliminating the name oh, of Monsanto. We have, we have the document saying that the deaths of the animals might be related to Roundup, that the dermal, tox the dermal penetration was a problem. All these things in the background, which, you know, when she was hidden from view, it was clear that she was concerned. And when she was on TV with me, 
she was this delightful, happy mother scientist. So I went back to the doctor's TV, talked to the, to the um, producer, and they said, okay, well, it looks like we'll do something, maybe three or four minutes. I gave him the name of Brent Wisner, the, the top attorney who was ended up winning two of the three lawsuits, and uh, they gave him the name of a plaintiff. They did something they've never done before, I believe. And then they, they put an entire episode just on this. No one from Monsanto showed up. So we had a field day describing what happened. Since then, <clears throat> the entire world now is aware of the dangers. It's been banned. Roundup has been banned all over the world in different places. We have rounduprisks.com to help people ban it in their schools, in their cities, um, in their parks, in their, in their um, homeowners associations. Uh, people are aware of the link. And now we also understand who in the EPA was Monsanto's lapdog. We have the names of the people that they were colluding with, the actual descriptions of the conversations. We have someone who used to work for the EPA that said, if I can stop another agency from doing research on glyphosate and cancer, I deserve a medal. In other words, you guys need to give me a medal because I'm working on your behalf. We have those documents. So it was very exciting, and the current situation right now, on, on Friday, last week, there was supposed to be a trial starting in St. Louis, which would have had a serious impact on Monsanto because they have yet more documents that they are ready to bring out. They can't make them public until it's part of the trial. And they were going to put Hugh Grant, not the actor, but the former CEO of Monsanto on trial, along with the scientists who were only um, you know, interviewed by tape. But when they're in St. Louis, they can be called and they have to show up. So this was going to be a fantastic uh, um, trial that was going to be televised, live streamed. And just be, the, the lawyers came in ready to start the trial. They had selected the jury. And then there was some whispers and they left the room. And what I'm told is they're that close to a global settlement. Mm. There's up to now 100,000 plaintiffs. 100,000 is the estimated number. Now, there was, in the three trials that went on, there was four plaintiffs. The jury awarded $2.3 billion. The judges brought it down to $190 million. And they're talking about a number of about eight to 10 billion for the settlement, although that's all secret stuff. I'm not privy to it. I haven't heard it as official. I've just read it. Um, but I actually, I have been pretty close to the situation. And when one couple got awarded by a jury, two billion zero point zero five five million dollars that night, I went out to dinner with them and the first plaintiff and all the attorneys, and it was surreal sitting next to the plaintiffs who had just been awarded $2 billion. And right now, because of the, of the high-profile coverage, even though the EPA is doubling down in support, there's enough, there's enough movement by consumers and movement by jurisdictions that we just heard today that Bayer is considering banning the sale to individuals who, who, who use it on gardens and just to companies like power line companies and farmers, et cetera, which is enormous. How enormous is that? And what, how much is sold to individuals versus how much is used commercially? I don't have the number, <clears throat> but it's the number, but Glass Roundup is the number one used weed killer in the world. Most people who use a chemical in their garden in many countries use Roundup. And it's interesting that the way it's applied in gardens is people look at the commercials that were run by Monsanto and there are people in shorts and tank tops spraying. In the documents made public from a lawsuit, they say, wear rubber gloves, wear rubber shoes, long pants, protect yourself. But to the general public, they show tank tops and shorts. It can go through because there's the surfactant, it can go through the shoes. In fact, the Tyvek suit, it can go through that. You pour some Roundup on it, it can, dry, it can drip through. So it's not, it is something that is driven into the body. Now, it's interesting about this surfactant, how it gets driven into the body. They were very concerned because it had higher absorption rate than anything they'd seen, 10%, which is 3.3 times the amount that's allowable by the EPA. <clears throat> they have to submit the data, but they, they 
lied, they hid the data. And then they did something which is so typical Monsanto. I could spend the next half hour giving examples of this. But this one was completely new to me, came out because of the trial. I was grateful to find something totally new. It was like a fresh present to me. They, the way they tested the absorption of Roundup, they took human get cadaver skin, <clears throat> cut it out, and they baked it in an oven. You know what happens when you bake meat? It gets really tough. That wasn't good enough. Then they froze it. Then they applied the round simulating up. normal conditions of life. Yeah, yeah, basically, right. basically. <laughs> for for those that are that are are, are burnt and frozen, yes. Um, and then they said, oh, hardly any absorbed. And they they gave that data to the EPA, never telling how they prepared the cadaver skin. But that was that was typical Monsanto, and I have so many examples of that blatant catching them red-handed. And it's interesting that um, when they released their announcement just yesterday that the EPA, the EPA said, you know, Roundup is fine. Chuck uh, Benbrook, who, had, who has been evaluating the impacts of, of pesticides on children and worked uh, with the, the, the Congress, et cetera, he was flabbergasted. So this, they didn't even tell uh, people who were applying it to wear the rubber gloves, <clears throat> to wear the rubber boots, they just said it's fine, and basically the catastrophe that has been happening will continue. And I think that once this is settled with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, which is the only cancer right now that's being tr being tried in the courts because of the e virtually every mouse or or, or uh, rat trial showed non-Hodgkin's lymphoma tumors, I think we're going to be able to do more research and link it to many many other diseases. So I think, you know, you've laid out this kind of political as well as, um, I should say, theoretical background for what's going on with this right now. And it's so helpful, I think, for people who are coming into this maybe with less of an understanding of this backstory. What would you say is maybe what they're hearing, which would make them think it's not as bad as I think? Um, I know I've heard a lot about how these mechanistic studies, these cellular studies are at concentrations that are a lot higher than what the average person might be exposed to. And so you, you start hearing these counter arguments to what you're saying, um, some of which may be valid, many of which may not. But what do you think are those counter arguments that maybe do hold a little bit of water? And how would you respond to people who are still looking at it from that way? <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Austin. Excellent question. Um, so the question is, are the amounts really relevant for human exposure, which is a perfect, a perfect lead into to these. <clears throat> yes, they are. Um, there was a study that was done with rats over two years. Uh, it was done by Dr. Seralini, and they found multiple massive tumors, <clears throat> multiple massive tumors, early death and organ damage in the rats at what's called environmentally relevant doses, levels that we would expect exposure on a per day, per body weight. Basis. So, you know, a small rat per day per body weight takes into account the rat size. So he found uh, toxicity in the liver and kidneys uh, among the organ damage as well as the pituitary. And so he preserved the tissues. And another team, uh, led by Michael Antonio from King's College, did an, a molecular examination of the liver and confirmed that there was non alcoholic fatty liver disease. And Michael told me, that of all the research done on Roundup, which is significant, a pretty big body of research, it was the one that you could say there was causation without a doubt. Mm. Without a doubt, the Roundup caused non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And it caused it at a level of parts per trillion. To put it in perspective, on a per body weight, per day basis, the EPA allows in our drinking water 437,500 times higher than was fed to the rats. It was parts per trillion. Now, the amount of people in the United States that have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, I have heard estimates up to 30%, some say 40%. A research study just found that those with the more serious one the serious version of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, a certain type was called hep something hepatitis, you, you know the name. Uh, yeah, it, it, they had higher levels of glyphosate in their urine. 
So it was a it was a high correlation between higher levels of glyphosate in the urine and the more serious non aliquot fatty liver disease. And that also can lead to cancer and cirrhosis and other problems. So it's a huge epidemic. So it is relevant. Now, another study, which was just done, was found that when you, pr when you put glyphosate on cancer cells from mice alone, nothing happened. But when you add another molecule or a compound that is found in every human being, then the mouse cancer cells started to multiply. And so, as you said, uh, David, in the, in the film Secret Ingredients, can you avoid Roundup completely? I don't think so. You can do, you can take, do your best to minimize your exposure. I mean, literally, it's in the air in the Midwest where they spray it a lot, in Montana, et cetera. It's in the rain. Some people have it in their drinking water. So there are things that we can do to detox, rebuild, and repair the body. But switching to organic is critical. Now, it's also true, this is very interesting. When you switch to organic, you get rid of a lot of things. We think that the GMOs and the Roundup are, are the leading candidates for what's going on. When we asked in audiences, what happens when you, to your body? What happened to your health when you switch to non-GMO and largely organic food? People in the audience would say, well, my digestion got better and this thing and all, a whole range. And I would always say, okay, how many others noticed a change in their digestive problem, a change in their allergies? And I got a pretty good footprint at 150 lectures, including about two dozen where I speak at medical conferences. So the practitioners were speaking in terms of thousands of patients. So it was a much bigger sample. Then I surveyed 3,256 people looking at the same 28 conditions that we had gathered from the, the meetings. And sure enough, it was pretty much the same distribution with digestive problems at the top, 85.2%. And it wasn't just minor improvements in digestion. Of those people, 80% was either significant, nearly gone, or completely recovered. And then we had things like fatigue and uh, obesity and brain fog and anxiety and depression and food sensitivities and allergies and constant pain. And I'm still above 50% of the respondents. And it went all the way down to two point to about 2% or one one and a half percent down to Parkinson's. And we have we have plausible, plausible causative pathways as to how GMOs or Roundup or the BT toxin insecticide that's found in some GMOs could exacerbate or even create every one of those conditions. Now, when you think about the fact that GMOs are, are people consume their body weight in GMOs per year, you would expect to see some of those conditions increase. And that's what we see, the more than 30 conditions rising. That's correlation, not proof of causation, but it's extra data as part of this pattern. Now we know that animals, both livestock and pets, are fed a ton of GMOs and Roundup. What do we hear from the veterinarians? When they switch them to non-GMO or organic food, they get better from many of these same conditions. What about the animal feeding studies? When you force feed GMOs and Roundup, guess what? Same conditions or more likely their precursors in short-term studies, where I asked, for example, Dr. Seralini, the famous researcher on GMOs, what kind of diseases would you predict from the 90-day studies that we see Monsanto doing? And he laid it all out, the hormonal problems, the organ damage, the accelerated aging, based on the, the changes just in the first 90 days. So there we have animals, humans, animal feeding studies, epidemiological evidence, and the, caus the plausible causative pathways which we described earlier when you asked what's the mode of action just of Roundup. So we have that, but now what we have is thousands of doctors prescribing non-GMO diets, and they're telling me their patients are getting better. And many of them say when Roundup and GMOs were put into the food supply, that's when a whole set of new complicated and pretty serious diseases happen, especially among children. So in the film, there's also Dr. Michelle Perrault talking about these changes, and then she had an aha moment looking at a a slide of the gut of rats that were fed GMOs and went, oh my God, this is what's happening to my children. Started putting families on organic diets and then the same things that used to work started to work again. So I think hearing what you're saying, I mean, there's a lot of reason to consider that this will continue to move forward to the point where it's relatively accepted that we should be trying to avoid these things as much as possible. And I kind of wonder 
let's say that happens. Let's okay. say that the public outcry gets to the point where people just refuse to eat anything that has been, let's say, sprayed with uh, Roundup. Maybe not quite GMO yet. Obviously, a lot of GMO foods have been introduced into the food supply for a long time, and so it would require a whole lot more effort to go backwards on that. But let's say we cancel out glyphosate. Do you imagine that the, um, I guess, financial repercussions on Monsanto would be sufficient to prohibit other companies from developing in its place and creating potentially even worse versions of the same compounds? I don't think that's the way it would work. Um, Bayer bought Monsanto. Bayer has its own um, portfolio of poison to add to the agricultural system. Yeah, it'd be a great name for a movie. Portfolio, <laughs> of, poison. portfolio of poisons. Hey, By Jeffrey Smith. Don't let that out. Don't don't let this part of the of the podcast. <laughs> I'm gonna get the URL right now. <laughs> Portfoliopoisons.com. I got it first. Um, no, the, the the whole mindset of industrial agriculture is not to create agriculture that harmonizes with nature, but to change nature so it meets the needs of, of industrial agriculture. So isn't so, that the whole human development in general? There we go. I mean, one of the, the most- dominion over the earth, yeah. right? Exactly. One of the most perverse situations is they want to genetically engineer out the mothering instinct from the livestock that they have in factory farms so that when you take their children away, they don't pay any attention. Um, I'm sure that that's something we all want to see in nature. So um, to give you an idea of where they're going, and this is actually far worse than what's happened so far. Gene editing is so cheap. CRISPR-Cas9, for example. I mean, you can buy a do-it-yourself kit for $161 on sale for $159 before the holidays to do your own bacterial genetic engineering with CRISPR-Cas9 in your, in your garage. For building your own biohacker lab, $2,000. If you happen to be a Monsanto purchased by Bayer, you have buildings full of robots driven by artificial intelligence. And so we're looking at the possibility of massive output, massive release into the ecosystem within the next 20 years. And we're talking about maybe hundreds of thousands or millions of different organisms. Now, as you know, the impact of release it is that you can't recall it. It becomes part of the gene pool. It will cross with the natural version and the offspring will have the problems. And the most common result of genetic engineering, including CRISPR-Cas9, all the varieties, is surprise side effects. Serious surprise side effects. Let me give you an example of one bacterium that was nearly released in, in the early 1990s. That was well-intentioned. Let's give farmers a bacteria that's normally found in every root and every plant all over the world. But this one's been designed to turn that plant into alcohol. So that instead of burning the stubble in their field, they'll mix it in big barrels with this bacteria, turn it into alcohol, run their tractor, and spread the slime on the, on the field as fertilizer because it's nutrient-rich. They were two weeks away from doing a test to see just how far that bacteria will spread. And a graduate student who happened to be doing, not required, they had already passed all the EPA tests, happened to be doing research on the sludge that was applied to, to soil in his laboratory, showed up on a Saturday morning, went to look at his, his wheat seedlings, and on, on the group that had been applied that sludge, they were all slimed. They would all turn to mush because the bacteria was still effective and it turned the roots and the, and the plants into alcohol. Now, that person's um, senior advisor, Dr. Lane Ingham, was told later by someone at the EPA secretly that the EPA had already done a study where they released a genetically engineered bacteria and monitored how far it spread. And within one year, it spread, within one growing season, it spread about 11 miles. But after they stopped paying for the monitoring, there was at least one person that was monitoring on her own time, on her own dime. And eventually they found the bacteria all over the world from one release in one place. Mm. So imagine if this bacterial type, Klebsiella planticula, took over and it does have a survival advantage over its normal parent because if it turns something to alcohol, the parent's killed and it can survive. Imagine if it forced out its natural parent and spread. I asked her what the consequence of release could have been and she said, the end of terrestrial plants. 
And this came three years after or four years after a near release of bacteria that would have changed the ability of some bacteria to condense water from, from, water, va from uh, water vapor into, into, into clouds. And it, turned, it also creates snow. If that had been released, it might have changed the world's weather patterns. So that's just two varieties of bacteria. And we're talking about releasing 10,000, 100,000, a million of different bacteria, butterflies, trees, fish, etc. And we're talking about literally replacing nature with a gene pool that's corrupted and prone to side effects so that no other generation after us, no other generation inherits what we did. This is a more serious issue than I can think of. And I just heard, I was just in Hawaii meeting with some people because I want to bring this information out to the world. This is what the Institute for Responsible Technology is focusing on right now to build a global response to this. Because this is an inevitable time in human civilization where we can easily redirect the streams of evolution in laboratories for all time, but we don't have the balancing ethics and morality and understanding of the DNA and long-term thinking in order to do it safely, if it was ever safe. So I, we're trying to bring it out to the world. So I was meeting with a group about bringing it to the indigenous people, among others. And one person told me about a prophecy that he had been given personally by a Hawaiian elder in 1991 that said, we need to do something around now, or it'll be the end of biological evolution as we know it. And that phrase is a better description of what I just described, of what we're focusing on, than I can think of. Mm. And so this, this is this is beyond the roundup. It is critical. It's an existential threat to the planet. Um, I would like to go back to, uh, you know, all of our discussion early on centered on roundup, glyphosate, active ingredient, in its relationship to genetic modification of uh, a seeds to create food. What might the threat be of the GMO issue, aside from what we just talked about with respect to bacteria, with respect to plants, aside from the modification that allows use of herbicides? Uh, what, what is the inherent risk of just straight out GMO unrelated to enhancing the resistance or, or the ability to use herbicides? I'll give two examples. The Seralini study, where they did a two-year evaluation, they did Roundup Ready corn designed to spray with Roundup. That's why, for those that don't know, most GMOs are Roundup Ready, designed by Monsanto to tolerate their otherwise deadly Roundup herbicide. That's why there's tons of Roundup spray right over the field, killing all of the things except the GMOs. So they took the Roundup Ready corn, sprayed it with Roundup, multiple massive tumors, early death, organ damage. Another group was put Roundup in the water, but not fed the GMO corn. Same problems. So you think, ah, it's the Roundup and not the corn. But you end up having the, round, the Roundup ready corn that was never sprayed with Roundup and another experimental group. Same thing, multiple massive tumors, early death, and organ damage. So it's the seed that's genetically engineered, the Roundup individually or together causing these problems. And if you look at the GMOs, you see, multi, you see potentially precancer. These are the uh, animal feeding studies. Potentially precancer cell growth in the digestive tract, smaller brains, livers, and testicles, partial atrophy of the liver and damaged immune system. In a study done in the 90s that, that found those were the results of the generic process, irrespective of what gene you put in. So all the G GMOs could be creating those things. Now I want to talk about two other issues that are generic for GMOs. One is based on double-stranded RNA. RNA used to be considered just a way station between DNA and proteins, and people didn't pay much attention to it. It turns out they are regulators of DNA expression, and there's a little tiny piece of, D of RNA that can fold back in itself called double-stranded RNA. It's very small, 22 nucleotides long, maybe, maybe smaller, and it's as if it hunts and finds a corresponding code in the genome, and then it silences that gene. So in genetically engineered potatoes and apples already on the market, they use this double-stranded RNA produced by the inserted gene, and it silences the gene that causes those to brown if sliced. So you have the Botox apple, lies at about its age, doesn't turn brown, so it could be 18 days old, 20 days old, cut, and you can eat it, and you won't know that it's, it's old, and you can have bruised, bruised um, cut potatoes that you won't know. There is the possibility that when you eat that, that apple, the double 
simple stranded RNA that's built into the apple could reprogram and silence our own genes. We know what happens interspecies. In fact, they fed a double stranded RNA meal to young honeybees in larval stage and then checked their DNA expression uh, twice late in two different periods a few weeks later. They were expecting nothing to happen because they wanted this particular double stranded RNA to be the control. 1,400 genes changed expression. Mm. 1,400, 10% of the genome were different in the group that was fed one meal. You can feed double stranded RNA to mice and change something in their liver. We know that it can affect humans. In fact, when you think about food, we used to think in terms of minerals and vitamins. Now we know that the double strand, no, that, that the RNA in general from the plants that we eat can help program the DNA expression, and it's part of the intelligence transfer between the food we eat and our own genetic expression. So there, I talked to one scientist who used to work at the USDA until he wrote a, an article saying, we don't have the capacity to do a safety assessment for this type of RNA, uh, RNA interference because of its impact on the non-target, meaning humans as well as other animals. Um, collateral, then, the collateral damage. And same thing with EPA, wrote the same thing because there's sprays now that were approved. Monsanto got an RNAi spray. You can spray it on, on crops. It will change the DNA expression of the insects to kill them. What happens if we get the spray and it penetrates? Will it change ours? So that's an example of something that may be far worse than the Roundup. And then we have the gene editing. When you, when you edit genes, you program some scissors. You give them, where's the cut? Cut here. And it cuts the double-stranded DNA, and then the cellular mechanism repairs it. Now, when you cut it, you want it to probably knock out a gene, for example, or add something. And, but once you cut, you lose all control. Now, up to that point, you may have accidental cuts all over the DNA. You may have hundreds or thousands of mutations. That happens. Those are problems. Additional problem is that when you cut it and it rejoins, it's as if the cellular mechanism will add patchwork DNA from what's ever in the environment. So they use serum from goats or, or cows, and it grabbed DNA from the serum and packed in to this mouse DNA, and now there's a retrovirus in the mouse DNA. That's not a good thing. They had hornless cattle, which they wanted to make hornless through the cutting because they wanted to stuff a lot of cows together in factory farms. When this was published in 2016, they said it was perfect, no side effects. This proves we don't need any regulation. Well, the FDA in September 2019 decided to sequence the DNA of the hornless cattle and said, guess what, guys, you missed something. You missed the bacterial DNA that was stuffed in by the cellular repair mechanism that happens to have antibiotic-resistant genes, which could end up promoting antibiotic-resistant diseases, which, can, which are already killing tremendous numbers around the world. So what can happen just with the genome, just with the, GM, the GMO editing or the, or, the, or the transfer of genes is enormous. The collateral damage to the D DNA. So we look at what's already happened with the, with the Roundup Ready corn that we talked about. There's over 200 changes of proteins and metabolites in the corn when they compared it to the parent strain. No one compared it before it was released. What's increased? Putrescine and cadaverine, two of my favorite compounds. They're designed to, they create the smell of rotting dead bodies. They're also linked to cancer and to um, allergies. And they're increased in Monsanto's corn. There's a BT toxin called producing corn. It has a new allergen that was switched on. It's gamazine. People don't know that they may be allergic only to that variety. It's not labeled. This is some of the examples that can happen generically from genetic engineering. Uh, you have a question? Uh, I mean, I, so much uh, <laughs> information that's really important to understand. You know, I think back to my days in basic medical training and how we had these drugs and we're told this is the receptor the drug binds to and all the side effects, well, maybe there's some interaction with other parts of the body. We're not really sure. <laughs> and, and hoping and trying to convince myself to believe that what I was doing was a targeted intervention when I prescribe a beta blocker, other blood pressure medications, and then thinking about how much bigger of a deal it is once you get to the level of DNA editing. I, I do have this question, which is, are you kind of from the 
Are you recommending that we put a hiatus on all gene editing for the time being until we have a better understanding of what we're doing, or that only certain highly regulated companies or government entities have the ability to do this? You, know, you hear these stories in the news about a girl who recently had gene editing and had her sickle cell um, mutation kind of ameliorated by including a different type of hemoglobin. And you hear these success stories, the multiple ideas of GMOs providing extra food, extra nutrition. And so I think it's hard to potentially get people to view it as we should go all the way back now and put a complete stop on this. So I guess you having all this information, what is your perspective on what the next little bit should look like as far as temporary restriction, full restriction, or some people allowed to do this? Excellent. So our Institute for Responsible Technology, we have been focused on two desires and two two pieces of our mission. No GMO products in the food supply and no outdoor release of, of living organisms that can reproduce. We don't take a position on human genetic engineering where it's a non-inheritable trait. So one of the people that I've been speaking with for 20 years, who I, I quote in my books, Dr. Michael Antonio, he is a human genetic engineer. He does evaluations of techniques that can be applied to, to correct defective genes. And he's in favor of using genetic engineering in that way. But because he's a genetic engineer, he's also aware of the meticulous uh, safeguards that are used and also the side effects that can occur. He's aware that in agricultural biotechnology, the safeguards do not exist and the side effects have already been evaluated and turned out to be devastating. Some of the side effects, there's a lot more that hasn't been done. So he, like I, we're not against the use of gene editing or genetic engineering in general for correcting a defective gene. I say keep it in the laboratory. So our feeling is that I would like to see this understanding that we do not yet have the ability to predict the future in terms of what happens when you make a single change. And this week we can verify with 30 years of evidence that we are still babes in the woods and relatively stupid. And yet, every time you do an outdoor release, you are sentencing all living beings and all future generations to live with your folly. And sometimes you may get away with it, and sometimes you may create a disaster or a cataclysm. We know that a single introduced species that lived in harmony with its own ecosystem, when it moves to a new location on the planet, it can become an invasive species and cause chaos. What they're looking at is changing the actual ecosystem, all the components of it, so that it's, it acts differently, but they don't test those changes, and we don't even have the capacity to test those changes. I remember I was sitting in a, I was at a, a workshop, and I'm a dancer. I love to dance. In fact, in fact, Monsanto did a private investigation analysis of me, trying to find a skeleton in my closet, found that I was a dancer, and now it was 20 years ago, and said, your dance teacher creates film on GMOs, just trying to discredit me. Well, you gotta one worry of their about those dance teachers. <laughs> I know. And one of their scientists is also a dancer because I met him in 2000 or 1999 at a swing dance uh, uh, workshop in St. Louis. And I knew it, I didn't know who he was, but I invited them to, to sit with us at a Thai restaurant. He sat right across from me. And I said, What do you do? And he told me he does. Is a, uh, a safety testing of GMOs for Monsanto. And you didn't so, know that. He, he, I didn't know that. He didn't know what I did. Um, I was working paid the bill on that one. I just imagined <laughs> the dance-off at that point. The dance-off. So <laughs> I said, you know, he's a fellow dancer. We're at lunch. So I kept it, you know, a light discussion of allergenic constructs. Um, but then, then I said to him, you know, when you insert a gene into the genome, you know that it's going to cause a mutation. It's insertional mutagenesis. Everyone knows you might damage something. How do you know that you're not damaging something that's important? And he said, well, we're learning more and more each day about what's considered important. And I'm thinking, it's a little late, guy. We're already eating this stuff. But then I said, what happens if the whole sequence is important? What happens if it uses, if the DNA uses laws of nature? quantum mechanics, quantum field effects that we don't know how to even evaluate, let alone see the results when you change it. And he was absolutely silent and he looked down and continued to eat and said nothing. Someone he came with said, that was deep. <laughs> and there was a little, and he just waited like a minute or two. And then he looked up and said, but we need genetic engineering. 
I said, what? And he described the whole feed the world myth, which isn't true. It doesn't increase average yield. It doesn't, it, it's not reliable. Agroecology can double yields in developing nations. The world, the world's most eva um, comprehensive evaluation of how to feed the world rejected GMOs as and had anything to do with their, their goals. And it was just a PR myth created to get Europe originally to because they were nervous about it. And then to get they spent two hundred and fifty million dollars in five years to convince Americans that GMOs were needed to feed the world, even though if they were designed to feed the world, it would look very different. So he was he was saying we need to feed the world, and that's why he was willing to feed the products of this unproven science to the entire population. Then I spoke to another Monsanto scientist and I said at one point at the end of the conversation, I said, you know, you cannot guarantee that you're not creating allergic reactions in a percentage of the population. And his response was, but we need genetic engineering to feed the world. And so, again, he was willing to risk us, Amazing. risk us, our health and the environment, all future generations, because of this myth that turns out to be false. Huh. Jeffrey, thank you for your time, as always. It's... Uh it gives us a lot to think about, right? Yeah, <laughs> but anyway, give you some uh, good, I got to give you some good news, David. Go uh, ahead. I, mean, good, I, I love some good news after. Please, please. Like, I tell people in my lectures, don't leave in the, in the middle. You'll be really depressed. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the good news. I've been doing this for a quarter of a century. And our focus at the Institute for Responsible Technology has been getting, has been designed to pretty much get the reaction that we already have just now. Like the stuff is bad. You know, we can do it in five minutes, we can do it in 10 minutes, but it's actually behavior change messaging. The new stuff about gene editing that hasn't been in part of the wheelhouse for until recently. The behavior change is about eating differently. It used to be about eating non-GMO, now it's organic. Now we know that when people switch to organic, Sometimes within two or three days, the brain fog goes away. The chronic conditions they've been struggling with for a lifetime can go away. It's, it's miraculous, but it's not. It's, it's biology. The efforts that we have made to get people to go non-GMO has paid off. We talked about a certain minimal number, a critical threshold, a tipping point needed to cause a change in the market share between the product that says non-GMO and the project that product that doesn't, as soon as the product that says non-GMO increases in its sales, then the product that doesn't will replace the ingredients so it can compete because there's no benefit to consumers by saying now with GMOs or low GMOs. No one wants that. So we were looking at maybe 5% of the U.S. Uh, consumers as necessary. We now have 46% of Americans who are surveyed saying, we're looking for non-GMO food, which you're getting, means- you're, we, you're, you're getting the job done. We're getting the job done. So I would say we have been massively successful. The food industry's on notice. They're eliminating GMOs and that is huge. Now we need to get people to also switch to organic. We need to get more information about the dangers of Roundup, which these lawsuits are doing. And now I'm switching, even though I'm not abandoning the behavior change messaging, but I'm letting the the movie Secret Ingredients do it because it does it better than I can and because you're in it, <laughs> David. Um, I'm focusing on now this new existential threat. And it's odd that our we have a benefit from global warming and climate problems and all that because there's more people now focused on planetary survival than any time in human history. And if they can widen their self-definition lens from climate change or oceans or whatever to planetary survival, this becomes an obvious additional part of their campaign. So we're hoping to create a global movement to have the same type of global impact that we've already had, that we know we can have. So I am extremely confident coming off of a huge success in changing the, the eating habits of over 150 million people uh, from just putting information out to a, 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 a press that wasn't open, to a multi-billion dollar company that tries to hit me like a whack-a-mole, we still succeeded. And now it's time to awaken the world to the bigger issue of protecting nature. So we have a three minute video at Protect Nature Now. And um, I recommend that we people share, see that and share it and send it around. 
We're creating new short videos about the dangers of the genetically modified bacteria we talked about. Mm. It won't be too long before the world will be aware that the very act of releasing a GMO or flushing your do-it-yourself bacteria down the toilet, which is an environmental release, is something we cannot afford to play with. And so I am confident we will win. We have science on our side and we can support nature so that nature will be on our side as well. Wow, what a, what a great ending. Um, give us a website people can go to to learn more. Okay, here are the websites. ResponsibleTechnology.org. That's the mothership of our non ResponsibleTechnology.org. Hopefully, yep. with any luck at all, it's appearing on the bottom of the screen as we speak. Okay. Uh, then I have a podcast and some other programs at LiveHealthyBeWell.com. LiveHealthyBeWell.com. You can go to the Secret Ingredients movie. You can see it help you. will help you switch to organic. We have experts helping you how to detox, rebuild, and repair from exposure to GMOs and Roundup in the past. That's at LiveHealthyBeWell.com. We have a unbranded site called Protect Nature Now, which is so that all the different nonprofits and leaders and everyone can send people there and not feel like we're competing with them. So that that's ProtectNatureNow.com. And we have petsandgmos.com and we have rounduprisks.com and et cetera, et cetera. But those, you can get to those from the ones that I've already mentioned. People need to contribute to you because you've got, you're paying for a lot of URLs here. So, yeah. In fact, in fact, I thank you for saying that. I don't know if you're aware, David, but I have, I am, you know, when it comes to trying to slay the dragon, I have no fear. When it comes to asking for money, I, I have had fear in the past and I've paid for it by not being able to bring the money into our nonprofit. So yes, in order for us to create a global campaign, we need campaigners and we don't have enough money to hire anyone extra at this point to do the work that's needed. And so please at responsibletechnology.org, that's where you can make a donation, ideally recurring donation, so we can count on the money to help budget so we can put people in place, create the assets and protect nature now. Wow. Jeffrey, thanks as always for your time. I look forward to seeing you. I might see you out in Anaheim, it looks like, perhaps. Who knows? Great. I look forward. I always love to, to see you and Lise. And thank you, Austin. It was nice to meet you. Thank and, you for a wonderful um, conversation. Yeah, yeah. Really great. And I love the fact that I know the people listening to your podcast and watching this are really clued into science, clued into health, very intelligent and ready to act based on the knowledge. So when you when you invited me to speak on this podcast, I was like, yes, absolutely. And I want to say you shine in the movie Secret Ingredients. So your fan base will get very proud of you for how you basically everyone who sees the movie wants to eat organic. And we've done pre and post tests on, on the audience. And it's like probably the number one, actually, it's certainly the number one most effective motivator to eat organic. And a lot of that has to do with you, David. So thank you so much for putting your brilliance. And I remember interviewing you in that same office where you are now and turning to my co-director, Amy Hart, and just saying, oh my God, this is like the dream come true interview. You are like plug and play, thank you. I've never been called plug and play before, but I guess no, no. it's a good <laughs> thing, right? Yeah, yeah, you're, you're plug and play. <laughs> talk to you soon, bye for now. All right, safe feeding. Well, that was really interesting and I think valuable information. He offers us up uh, a very um, interesting perspective on uh, GMO and what uh, it, uh, what a potential threat or multiple threats may be. Again, it's really valuable to uh, listen to thought leaders in various areas, hear what they have to say, listen to their opinions, and, uh, and then move on. Ask yourself if this is important information for you. And that is really uh, what we try to accomplish here on The Empowering Neurologist. Uh, grateful for Dr. Austin Perlmutter for joining us today, and we hope to see you here soon. Bye for now.